Good morning, everybody. So, this video is not going to be like my other or my usual content. So, this morning, I actually want to do a little bit of a Bible study. This is one of my Bibles, but anyway. Um, let me just get my phone here so I can get my notes. Um, photos. Okay, so, um... <clears throat> This this message that I'm going to deliver, now mind you, I, I'm, I'm just going to lay it out front. I'm not a pastor like my dad, but I have done a lot of Bible studies in the past, and uh, it's something I'm quite passionate about doing. Um, let me start off by saying, this is not just another book on my shelf. I believe that this book is the inspired, inerrant Word of God, and I believe that God says exactly what He means, and means exactly what He says. Uh, I believe that every word that comes out of this book is absolutely true, and um, that's what I believe. So while I'm finding my place here, uh, just give me a minute. Ephesians 2. Okay, there we go. Um, I'm going to be starting this study in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Um, but having found our place, uh, let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you now for uh, this opportunity that you've given to me and this uh, topic that you've laid on my heart. Um, I pray that uh, this would be a blessing to some. Uh, and uh, I pray that it would lead others to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray that everyone could glean something from this video, uh, from this Bible study that uh, I'm doing. Um, and I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding and speak to our hearts. And dear God, please don't exclude my heart. We thank you now for... Uh, this time that we have, and we pray that it would be a blessing, and that you would speak to hearts and minds. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So, <clears throat> this this uh, this video or this message is going to be entitled "The Cost of Grace." So, um, I'm going to start out in Ephesians two. Actually, yeah, and I'm going to go start out in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show his exceeding, the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast.
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. <clears throat> Dear friends, those of us who are saved and those of us who, who uh, believe what is called the grace message, we talk a lot about grace. And um, I, I, I want to say this. Do we truly grasp, do we understand what the grace of God costs. Do we understand that? You know, a lot of people will tell you it doesn't cost anything to be gracious to people. Well, with any act of grace, there's some kind of cost. You know, people say, well, you know, you're, you're a gracious host or you're a gracious person. <clears throat> but there is a cost to grace. Grace is not free. It, it is freely given, but there is a cost. For example, uh, let, me, let me tell you a story. When I was a student in Pensacola Christian College, I used to go off campus, and I, I don't, I don't remember um, the the name of the business, or or what business this was around, but I used to park my car in in this parking lot, and it was a vast parking lot. Um, but I used to park my car there and just sit there just to be alone um, for a little while. And I might pray or read my Bible or something. And every day in Pensacola, I would see homeless people. Now, I usually never talk to those people. I, you know, I, I just usually never paid them any mind. But on one particular day, I decided that I would go and speak to these two men that were sitting uh, near, near some trees by this, uh, in this parking lot. So I did. And I, I got to know these men, and one of them, his name was Mark. Now, Mark, Mark, in the course of my talking to him, he professed to know Jesus as his Savior. But, of course, I gave him the gospel, and he, he then told me that he ultimately did not know Jesus as his Savior, but he would like to. So I, I led that man to the Lord. And then I gave him a Bible. And I also gave him a winter jacket that I had that I didn't need because I was in the state of Florida where it's hot. Um, now, now I say all that not, not to brag. No, I'm not, I'm not bragging. Um, I say all that to say this, that that was a gracious gesture, I, I will admit, but there was a cost. What, what was the cost of that? The cost was time. The cost was time, and not only was it time, but a Bible was given. There was a cost of that. And I gave him a jacket. There was that cost as well. 
you give away what you have. That is grace. And that that is as simple as I can say it. But what we are saved by grace through faith. It says it right here. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. But what, what was the cost of that grace? Let's examine the cost of that grace. And let, let's, let's go back a little bit in, in time. So I'm going to go to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. So we all know, well, most of us know the story of how mankind was created and Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden. We know that. And in uh, Genesis chapter 3, uh, we can read the account of how Satan tempted Eve. You see, in, for those of you who don't know this story, man was created by God for, for one reason. Well, actually for a few reasons. One, to fellowship with God. The Bible says that in the Garden of Eden, man walked with God. God walked with man in the Garden. God talked to man. God fellowshiped with man. They were in harmony with one another. Now, God gave man one simple rule. One rule. One rule that man was given in the Garden of Eden. God said, any tree that is in this garden is yours for food. You can eat from any tree in this garden, but there's one tree, one tree in the middle of the garden that you shall not eat from. And that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, one tree you shall not eat of it, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So Satan came into the garden in the form of a serpent. And you can, you can read this in Genesis chapter 3. And he tempted Eve. And basic, he, I'll, I'll just read it, right? Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Then the woman saw the tree, that it was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. And also gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, what happened there? Here you have the first two human beings in history in the most idyllic 
place you could ever want to live. They wanted for nothing. They didn't have to work very hard for their food. All they had to do was either pick it off a bush or a vine or climb a tree to get it. They had no worries in that garden at all. They had all the water they could want, all the fruit they could want, Every, all their needs were provided for, and they had one task, one rule that they were given. Do not eat of the tree in the middle of the garden. Satan comes along, and he talks to Eve. And Satan deceives her. And ultimately, Adam and Eve broke God's rule. They both ate of the tree. Now, what happened after that? See, Adam and Eve were created in a state of innocence. They didn't, they didn't understand that they were naked. They had no need for clothing. They, they felt no shame in, in the way that they were created. They didn't know that it, they didn't know any right or any good or evil. They just existed in fellowship with God. But as soon as they ate that fruit, something happened. A change happened. They knew immediately that they were naked and they felt shame and they hid from God. Now, God, God in his wisdom after man had sinned against God, God made a plan. He said, I must make a plan to redeem mankind and bring them back into a state of fellowship with me. And the only way to do that was to have a perfect, sinless being pay the ultimate price for sin, which is what? Death. The Bible, the Bible, the Word of God says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what it says. So God sent his only begotten son to this earth for one reason. To pay for the sins of mankind. To redeem you and I and bring us back unto himself. But, but what was the cost? What was the cost? Well, let me, let me tell you about the cost of God's grace. You see, salvation is a free gift. It's a, it, it is the best gift and most gracious gift that's ever given. And it's also the most costly gift that was ever given. I, I don't care, I don't care how much money or, or, or how many things of great value someone might give. There is nothing in this world that will ever equal the gift that God gave to you and I. Nothing. Nothing. Why? Because God gave his only son. I, I have a son. And I can tell you, I would protect my son 
with my very life. I want nothing to happen to my son. Nothing. My son is my joy, my, my pride, my, my treasure. I love my son with all my heart. And God, God loved his son with everything in him. And yet, he sent him to earth to pay a debt he did not owe. And there was a cost to that. Now, Jesus is omniscient. Jesus knows everything. So I, I want you to imagine this for a moment. I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine knowing every single event that is going to take place in your life. You know every single friend, every single acquaintance that you will come in contact with. You know every meal you're going to eat. You know every single place that you will ever go. You know every single thing that will ever happen to you in your whole life. Now, I want you to, to picture this. Jesus Christ knew before he even set foot on the earth. He knew his entire life on this earth. From the beginning of his earthly life to the end of his earthly life. Jesus knew everything. He knew he would be betrayed. He knew that. And yet, and yet, dear friends, he still did nothing, nothing to change any of that. Nothing at all. Why? Because that was the plan of God. That was God's plan. The cost of grace is great. So great, in fact, that Jesus Christ would endure so much suffering, so much pain, so much agony for you and I. Let's, let's just examine a few things. Let me see. I think I want to go to the book of Luke. Um, So, here we are. Um, actually, I'm going to go to Luke. Luke chapter 22. So, we all, we, we know that when Jesus was on the earth, he, he healed the sick, he healed the lame, he, he performed many miracles, he was loved by many. Now, Jesus had 12 disciples. And he chose those men. One of those men was named Judas Iscariot. 
And Judas Iscariot was going to be the one who betrayed Jesus. Now, now, this is part of the cost of grace, dear friends. This is part of the cost of grace. Jesus knew that this man, one of his closest friends, was going to stab him in the back and give him to the authorities. And, and here's another thing. It wasn't it wasn't, oh, I'll just hand Jesus over to the authorities. No, no, dear friends. In Luke 22, this is what we find. I'm going to start in chapter, in verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and scribes, sought how they might kill him, him being Jesus. For they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being one of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the, high, with the chief priests and captains, how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenant to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Now, you have one of Jesus' closest friends. And he goes to the enemies of Jesus and says, sure, you, you want to know where Jesus is? I'll tell you, but it's going to cost you. You know what the cost was? You know what they gave Judas for betraying Jesus Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, God in human flesh? 30 pieces of silver. Now, you might say, well, that's, that's, that's a lot. No, it's not. 30 pieces of silver in that time period was the cost of a common slave. Judas betrayed Jesus Christ for no more than the cost of a common slave. And then Judas, after the, the Passover had happened, and, and Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas would lead the chief priests and their temple guards to arrest Jesus. Now, that, that, would, that would cause me heartache. If I found out that one of, if I knew one of my best friends was going to betray me somehow, that's heartache, friends. That's sorrow. That's part of the cost of grace. And then we go, we go to the Garden of Gethsemane. We go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And we, we, we read in the, the four Gospels that while they, while they were there, Jesus had gone there to pray. And while he was there in that garden, praying, to his father. 
a medical phenomenon happens. A medical phenomenon happens. It says in the Bible that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Now, you might think that that, that is something that may have only happened to Jesus. No, this is a medical phenomenon. I don't remember what it's called, but I have read about this. This actually can happen. Dear friends, this can happen. You, the human body, can go through a great amount of stress. But there is a point when the stress can become so great that you actually begin to sweat blood. Blood pours from your head like sweat. I can't, I cannot imagine, I can't imagine the mental agony and the mental stress that it, that you have to go through in order for your body to begin releasing blood through your pores. That is the cost, that's another part of the cost of grace. Mental agony and suffering. Greatest, great suffering. Jesus suffered, not only physically, no, that would come later. But in this garden, he is suffering. He knows he's about to endure one of the most painful, agonizing times in his existence earthly existence and he suffers dear friends and this is something that happened willingly Jesus willingly endured this he told the father in the garden it's not my will not my will be done but yours. He went willingly out of obedience to the will of the Father. Now, after, after Jesus' betrayal, what happens then? Jesus is arrested. Not only is he arrested, but in the garden, or after they take him away, he is beaten and he is mocked. In, in Luke 22, verse 63, it says, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face. And asked him, saying, Prophesy, who was it that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously spoken against him. Now, have you ever been punched in the face? I have. And it hurts. It does. But I want you to imagine being senselessly beaten for who knows how long. The Bible says in, in verse 66 of Luke 22, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together 
and led him into their council. So that could have been ours that he was being beaten and hit and spat upon. That's what the Bible says, dear friends. The Bible says he was beaten and spat upon. The Bible also says, see, I have a little bit of a beard. But the Bible also says that these men grabbed Jesus by the beard and quite literally ripped the beard out of his face. They tore the hair out of his face. Now I've pulled I've pulled hairs out of my beard and it hurts. It does. But I cannot imagine the force needed to grab someone by a long beard and tug so hard that you tear it from their face. But that wasn't that wasn't the worst of the things Jesus endured. No. No, no. So, Jesus, after this, after his trial before the high priests, he goes before Pilate. And he gets mocked some more. Not only does he get mocked some more, he gets beaten some more. And they put a crown made of thorns on his head. But not only did they put it on his head, they then take rods and they beat it. They beat those thorns into Jesus' head. More blood is shed. More degradation, more more agony, more suffering. But then, Jesus Christ would endure one of the most vile, agonizing punishments that I've ever heard of. See, We, we read these accounts in the scriptures, but do we ever take and examine exactly what this entailed? We know that Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus. What did, so he, what did he say? He said, I will scourge him and then let him go. This was not a simple, a simple flogging. No, 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 dear friends, no. The ancient Romans, they had a torture squad. You, you can look this up. It's a historical fact. They had a torture squad. And these men specialized in punishment. They specialized. They had multiple tools at their disposal and they were masters of every single one of them. But one of the most brutal tools that they had was called a cat of nine tails. This was a whip that had nine leather thongs on it. Nine pieces of rawhide leather. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever felt a bull whip come across your skin. I have. Several times. It's not a joyous experience. It, it hurts. It's painful. I have a scar on my finger 
from where I got clipped with a bullwhip. While doing a, a, a bullwhip trick, I was holding a piece of paper, and that bullwhip came and hit my finger, and it drew blood from my finger. Now, I want you to imagine this, this cat of nine tails. And, dear friends, not only was it this nine, nine pieces of leather, oh no, 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 no. This, this, every single thong of leather on this whip had things tied in it. Things like lead balls, pieces of bone, fish hooks, pieces of metal. This was designed for torture. And when you, when someone would be hit with this whip, it would tear the skin right off your bones. It would tear the skin and muscle off your body. Tear you open. And the law of that day said 40 lashes minus one. And and here's another thing. Let let me let me let me be perfectly clear. This was not a common thing for someone to be scourged with a cat of nine tails and then be crucified. Why was that uncommon? Because most men never lived that long. Most men never made it to 39 lashes. They either died of shock or blood loss. One of the two. Most men never lived that long. But Jesus endured this. Jesus, the Bible says, the word of God says, Jesus was marred more than any living man. The Bible says Jesus was beaten so badly he was unrecognizable as a human being. That's the cost of grace. That is part of the cost of grace. Mental suffering. Degradation. And the one of the most painful, painful punishments you could endure. Dear friends, bone, bone was exposed on Jesus Christ's body. They literally took this whip and they skinned him alive. And then he would go to be crucified. Now, now you see in, in movies and paintings Jesus Christ carrying an entire cross on his back. Folks, I'm here to tell you, number one, that's an exaggeration. That never happened. Even without a scourging, I don't think any man could carry an entire cross by himself. The, the middle part of the cross, which is called the patibulum, that was where the arms would be laid. The middle part of this cross alone weighed 110 pounds. And the Romans were, here, here's another reason I know that to be true. The Romans were experts at crucifixion. They did it quickly and efficiently. That means that they had a place already designated for crucifixions. So history tells us 
that or history suggests that there may have been a place already set up and they would have had straight poles in the ground. So Jesus would not have carried an entire cross. No, he would have had to carry just the middle part. And you see that you see that in videos and movies, Jesus walking, carrying this cross. No, no, friends, no, no. That would have been physically impossible given the punishment he had just endured. He could not have carried that cross. No, they had someone carry it for him. And then when they get to Golgotha, the place of the skull, our Savior had to endure more degradation yet. He endured the loss of his very dignity. The Romans stripped him naked. They laid him down on the ground and they nailed him to a cross. Now these nails, these na I looked up the dimensions of these nails. These are not just, you know, normal nails. These nails were seven to nine inches long. Seven to nine inches long. And three-eighths of an inch thick. That's, that's a big nail. And these nails were driven into his hands and his feet. Now, now when the Bible says hands, it doesn't mean here. No, no. The Romans considered the wrist to be part of the hand. If you look right here, if you feel right here in your wrist, where is it? I can find it better in this hand for some reason. Right here where my finger is, you'll find that there's this gap. And it's the same it's the same here on the other side. That is where people suggest that a crucifixion nail was driven because it's not going to break any bones. And we know that the word of God says not a bone was broken. It's not going to break any bones. But there's a ton of nerves in your hand, in your wrist. So these nails were passed through Jesus' wrists and his feet. And he was hoisted in the air and then dropped into a hole. It didn't break any bones. It dislocated some, I can guarantee you. The word of God, I think it's in the Psalms. Uh, where David wrote and he was he was foretelling Jesus crucifixion it says my bones are out of joint his bones were out of joint now I don't know if you if you've studied on crucifixion or not but I have this is one of the most painful, agonizing ways to die. You weren't just nailed to a cross and you stayed up there for a few hours and then you died. In some cases in history, it says that men, or in some cases women, could stay on a cross for days. 
But we know that didn't happen to Jesus because of the risk of the Passover. They wanted to get it done as soon as possible. But Jesus stayed on this cross for hours. And dear friends, when you are, when one is on a cross, you can't just take a breath like I'm breathing right now. No. You had to quite literally put yourself through more pain to even take a breath. Victims of crucifixion had to push up. They had to push themselves up because the longer you were on that cross, your body began to sag down, putting pressure on your internal organs. And in order for you to breathe, you had to push yourself up to breathe in. And then you would let yourself sag back down when you exhaled. Now, what would that cause you? The very nerves in your feet, in your hands, would be rubbed raw by the friction of your body adjusting its posture. More agony every time you take a breath. And in Jesus' case, it would have been made worse. His back was raw. And every time he raised his body up, he racked his back against rough, splintered wood. For hours, he felt so much pain and suffering and agony. And yet the Bible says, like a sheep before his shearer is dumb, so opened he not his mouth. Jesus never once said, Oh, I'll get you. I'll make sure that you suffer for what you've done. What you're doing to me, I will make you pay. No. No, no, dear friends. He suffered all of this without any thoughts of vengeance or any anger at all towards anyone. No. The Bible says that Jesus talked while he was on the cross. And mind you, every time he may have uttered a sentence, he would have had to raise himself up to breathe. Even talking was an agony. On this cross, he yet showed compassion. He showed compassion to the two men who were crucified with him on that day. He welcomed a thief into paradise with him. These hours of agony were nothing to Jesus in comparison with the final, the final cost of grace. Separation. Separation from his dear father because at one point the sky grew dark and at that point the Bible says the sins of man were laid on him. The sins of mankind were placed on Jesus Christ at that point. And it says in the word of God that at that point, God had to turn his eyes from his son. He could not look at his son anymore because Jesus Christ had become sin. His own son, God's dear son, became abhorrent to God. God could not look on Jesus anymore. 
And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you imagine the agony that he would have had to feel knowing that his father couldn't even look at him? And that was for you and I. Grace costs a lot, dear friends. And grace yet is freely given to you and I. The, the, the best part of this whole story is this. Jesus Christ, he did, he did die. He gave up the ghost. And as he, as he foretold, he spent three days in a borrowed tomb. But praise God, three days. And he rose from the dead. He conquered sin, death, and the grave for you and I. The cost of grace is far greater than we can imagine. Dear friends, I hope that you have, have uh, gleaned something from this, this endeavor, uh, this talk of mine. But dear friends, here, here's what I want to ask you. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you don't, I encourage you. Salvation is freely given. I would encourage you to take that gift and accept it. Accept it now. Accept it today. The Bible says we're not promised a tomorrow. Salvation, all you have to do to be saved is simply believe in the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. You have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's all you have to do. And just accept that free gift. Have you made the decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? If today is the first time that you have made that decision, please reach out to me somehow. Whether it's a private message on Facebook <coughs> or in a comment, please don't hesitate. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Please don't wait. Don't put this off. The cost of grace was great, and yet it was freely given to you and I. There's a good song that says, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. You might think, well, what do I need salvation for? I'm a good person. Surely I'll go to heaven when I die. No, dear friends, no. On your best day, you will never be as good as God. Without the, the gift of salvation, you have no hope of attaining heaven. You must be saved. You must put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Please, don't wait. 
Again, if you have made the decision for Christ today, for the very first time, Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I would be happy to both welcome you in the family of God and I would show you how you can learn more and, and, and begin your life in Christ. Please don't hesitate. Thank you very much for your kind attention. This has been me. And now I'm going to sign off. Thank you very much.